Live Better and Longer with The Fitness Show, hosted by fitness expert, author, and TV personality, Fitz Kohler. She'll tell you why diets are dumb, supplements are snake oil, and the truth about how you can earn a lean, hard, pain-free, and athletic body. Now for our favorite bossy blonde, Fitz Kohler. Hi team, I'm Fitz Kohler, your very noisy fitness expert from fitness.com, and welcome to The Fitness Show. I'm going to start out with a big apology for not posting an episode last week. I was sick, and I'll tell you why in a little bit, but <laughs> know that I really wanted to, and I could not. So I am sorry, and I think when you do something wrong, even if you didn't do it on purpose, you should say you're sorry. So I'm telling you, I'm sorry. I'm sure you were <sighs> tortured all week by the lack of new episode, but I do know that most of you went back and listened to at least five or six of the previous 150 something episodes I have posted over the years. So I know that you were able to self self soothe by listening to my big mouth guide you on fitness and tell you weird stories last week. So there you go. Sorry about that. Moving on. I'd like to start by honoring a fine athlete who we lost this week. Kelvin Kiptum was the fastest marathon runner in the world and 24 years old from Kenya. He passed away this week in a car accident. He drove into a ditch and hit a tree and his trainer was with them and both of them passed. Kelvin was a husband. Kelvin had two children. So that's obviously the greatest loss right there is that of a husband and a father and probably somebody's son as well. But he happened to be the fastest man in the world. This is a young man who ran three marathons in his lifetime and hit it out of the park every single time in a very significant way. Funny, we talk about marathon greatness. And I see the 30s, late 30s being the sweet spot for most, most marathon runners. This guy was 24 and had already, already accomplished so much. And the very first marathon he ever ran was in Valencia, Spain in 22. He won that marathon with a time of two hours, one minute and 53 seconds. Mind-blowing. Two hours, one minute and 53 seconds on his very first marathon, which means he came very close to breaking the world record on his very first marathon. And then at the London Marathon in 23, he crushed that field to win in two hours, one minute and 25 seconds, which is the second fastest time in history. At that point, he was 16 seconds shy of Iliad Kipchoge's record of 201.09. And then with his third marathon, which was Chicago in October on a very flat course, he obliterated Kipchoge's record with a time of two hours and 35 seconds. That's not two hours and one minute because that would of course be forever. No, no, no. <laughs> two hours and 35 seconds it was only his third marathon. One can only imagine this is a young man that would have broken his own record many more times and, and broken the speed barrier for marathon running. <sighs> beyond what we could have imagined. So it's a tragedy when any young person loses their life, but you hate to see it when it's a father, a husband, and someone with such a very, such a bright future, the ability to take our sport to a new level. Sometimes you think, oh, all these records get broken. And, and then you think perhaps we're at a place where you can't break the record anymore. The human body just can't do anymore. And then somebody makes you believe that the human body can do more. And that is Kelvin Kiptum. That was Kelvin Kiptum. So, uh, yeah, a tragedy for the endurance sports community. And he was favored. He and Kipchoge were favored at the Paris Olympics this summer. So just just sad all around. And, you know, I'm sure no one in his family is listening to the show, but sending my love to them, to anyone who knew and loved Kiptum, I know many people within within my community, within my endurance sports community, did know Kelvin. I did not. I never announced a race where he was running or met him at another event. But I, I know plenty of my friends have interacted with this young man, and I'm sure they are crushed. So just a little bit of homage to a world-class athlete and a fine young man 
rest in peace. So now we're going to change course. I've got a lot to cover, a lot to cover in this show. And I'm going to start off with something very, very weird that I've just been dying to tell you about. It's very silly, but uh, I think it was very funny and it's worth sharing. So a few weeks ago, I went to the gym early in the morning and came home, I don't know, eight something in the morning. And I walked into my house and I have two dogs. That's of no, that's of no. Actually, I dropped the younger, dog, the little dog, Joey. I dropped him off to get his teeth cleaning. That's why I was up so early. Then I worked out and then I came home and my older dog Piper was here. And the second I walked into the house, I smelled something and I thought, oh gosh, she had an accident. She must have had a very big accident because it smells really bad. And so I come in through the front door and I start creeping around my house. Now, you know what it's like when you're looking for something and you know you're going to find it and you don't want to find it. But there I am. I got I put down my my gym bag and I'm now tiptoeing through my house, hoping I don't find what I know I'm going to find. And eventually I get to the spot behind the couch. And what I'm expecting to see is a pile of normal poo shaped dog poo or uh, maybe a liquidy, <laughs> which is yucky to say, but I don't. I go back there and I see uh, a four foot by four foot square of poo that has been smeared deeply into my carpet. And there's little teeny poo poo flecks <laughs> all over the place, little, little teeny specks of poop on the carpet. And I just was so confused coming clearly Piper didn't do that. And I thought, well, perhaps my son, perhaps he woke up in the middle of the night, saw the mess and tried to clean it up and then got tired and went back to bed. And I just could not figure out what had gone on and why this poop was just smeared into my carpet. And it took me a few minutes. And then I had the revelation. It was Linda. Linda was our robotic vacuum. That's right. She found Piper's poop and she vacuumed it over and over and over again and just smeared it everywhere. It was absolutely appalling. And, and I want you to visualize this because I have beige Berber carpet, tight, short Berber carpet, and it was God awful. It was so awful. And you know, sometimes you're just flabbergasted and you have your loss. Like, what do I do? Right. But what could I do other than get my wet back and get on my hands and knees and for a good hour, scrub that mess. But once I realized it was Linda, even though I was so grossed out, I, I don't recall the last time I laughed so hard. That was crazy. Can you imagine if your robotic vacuum just back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, just smeared the poop all the way into the carpet. It was, it was vile and it was hilarious. And thankfully, because I have that little green machine, I think it's a little Bissell vacuum. I was able to get it all out. I'm very proud of myself. I called the professional carpet cleaner and he was like, well, we don't come out for less than a hundred bucks. And I thought, ah, screw it. I'll just clean it myself. Cause I just recently had my carpet clean, but robotic vacuums. Who knew there was a liability involved? Yes, they can suck up your cords, your uh, charging cords and whatever, but boy, what a mess. So as you can imagine, Linda was also a mess. Linda had ingested all of that nightmare. So I put Linda in the trash can and bid her adieu. That was another RIP because that was not going to happen. Nobody was cleaning Linda. So now I have a new guy and his name is Dusty. Dusty hopefully will never get into any sort of chaos like Linda does. Linda was a problem. I mean, she worked hard for a very long time, but yeah. Ew, right? I, I don't know. I needed to tell you this, but I thought my audience needed to know. Sometimes you go through such trauma that you just have to share it with people. And I am. I also have some other nonsense to go over with you, which I think there is a lesson learned. You know how sometimes people get involved in these wars on social media that they should not. And I have been doing my darndest for quite a few years now to just stay out of it, to stay out of other people's ugly arguments, to not voice my opinion. And I speak so much that sometimes the greatest thing I, I say are the things that I don't say. So I'm learning just like everybody else is. So as many years ago, I'm in Vegas working as a spokesperson for a footwear company. 
and they have me doing news segments from this massive sh shoe show. And so I'm there and Fergie is also there. Fergie has a line of footwear. And so at some point she came over and she said, you are so fit. And I said, well, thank you. I work out to your music. And it was just such a really sweet interaction. She was so lovely. And uh, yeah, she's very fit too, but we had a picture taken. And so I, I shared that photo. The, sh the photo appeared, I guess, I don't know, on my timeline on Facebook. And so I reshared it and said, oh, I had this interaction with Fergie. And, and I restated what she said that she said I was so fit. And I said, I worked out to her music and we squealed and had a hug and it was nice. And so many, many people commented and said, oh, I love her. She's so great. Cool for you. Whatever. But this one guy who he's on my social contacts, I don't really know who he is. He's apparently in my hometown and the name he uses online, I don't even think it's his real name. I think it's the, a fictional character from a movie. So I don't really know who this guy is. I've seen him uh, comment on my stuff or I've seen him comment on other people's stuff, but I don't think I've ever had lunch with this guy or I don't even know if we've ever been in the same room. Anyway, so he comments that what kind of person are you? And why I don't understand why everybody's so starstruck and why we're putting these people on pedestals and blah, blah, blah. He's got a real lecture for all of us, all of us, which, you know, is just so appreciated. And I responded, I said, I don't think anybody's putting her on a pedestal. She's a nice person. Oh, and what did she say? Oh, these enter he said, these entertainers have very low IQs. And so it was my page, my photo. So I responded. I said, I don't really view entertainers and artists as people with low IQ. She makes fun music that I enjoy. And a lot of people enjoy. She seemed like a nice girl. She was kind to me. Why wouldn't I be kind in response? Rah, rah, rah. He really wanted to lecture us about how foolish we were for thinking highly of this musician. And oh, we got the full blown lecture. And I and I just responded. I said, well, I, I disagree. And then he started talking down to my friends. And at that point, I just said, you're cranky and mean and stop talking mean. Stop saying mean things to my friends. But he kept going. And then some other people dove in. But what I just I think that people need to stop that stuff, right? Just stop it. If you're one of those people who can't keep your mouth shut and you have to jump in and be a part of the discourse, stop. The world has enough of it and it's not all puppy dogs and rainbows and there are probably important things that we should be speaking out on and and that's justifiable but i don't know there's a lot of ugly heat on social media just just stay out of it that's my advice i think <laughs> i think it's my advice because it'll make you happier it'll take away the stress and i think when you're happier and stress free you're more likely to keep doing things that are good for you, like exercise and eat right. And you're less likely to abuse alcohol and less likely to abuse cigarettes and so forth. So anyways, that's my thought. I just, well, maybe we should all stay out of it. That's it. <laughs> that's my message. Long drawn out story about me and Fergie. Picture is super cute, by the way. She's all dressed up Fergalicious style and I'm just in exercise clothes, which I suppose is very Fitzalicious of me. But yeah, stay out of the drama. Ugh, can we do with a little of that, a little less of that? And quite honestly, I think people are saying things online. Well, I know they're that they would never say in person, right? Never say to your face. I don't think this guy would ever come up to me and say, why would you take a picture with her? You're so naive. I'm not voting like Fergie. I don't care who Fergie votes for. Her. She's a nice person. And I certainly appreciate musical artists, especially as I sit here struggling with my guitar every day, trying to get better. Uh, so to be around people who are fine musicians, I actually think that's quite impressive. But yeah, so uh, you needed to know about Linda and the mess and Fergie and the social media mess. We want to stop making messes. So how did I get sick? A couple of weeks ago, I was at a running conference in Orlando. I left from Gainesville. I drove down. It was a great conference. It's for running industry professionals. And it's a wonderful opportunity for Everybody come together, learn some new things, grab some updates on marketing or course course measuring or whatever. There's not any race announcer courses, but that's fine. That's fine. That's not really why I'm there. And then it's it's fantastic networking. So the race directors of all the biggies, Chicago, New York, Boston, Los Angeles, Big Sur, and then a whole bunch of smaller races too. And, and I really love connecting with running professionals. I did a bit of speaking and a little bit of race announcing. So very fun weekend in Orlando. Now I got there 
and I did not sleep very well. It was one of those nights, you know how you get out of town and you don't sleep in your own bed and sometimes things hit the fan. I might've gotten three nights of, or three hours of sleep the first night, which wasn't a good idea. Worked all day at the conference and then drove to Jacksonville for the Donna. Now the Donna National Marathon to finish breast cancer just happened in the first weekend of February. And I think you guys know, I love that event. It is absolutely world-class and it's interesting. Sometimes we have certain races where we, we just expect all of the big deal stuff. Now, of course there's the majors and then there's big Sur and some others that we just hold in high regard. But the Donna is this, it's, I almost want to call it a sleeper because it doesn't have the same recognition as Big Sur, for example, but it has all of the bells and whistles. It has got so much good stuff going on. And it's such a small organization founded by Donna Deegan, who's, uh, she's a three-time breast cancer survivor. She's now actually mayor of Jacksonville, which is, she's a very impressive person, just a tiny little woman who's such a powerhouse, who wants something done and gets it done. But it's her executive director, Amanda Napolitano, who's also my race director. She's just... I don't know. She's beyond. She is so beyond because I don't know. I mean, I think in, I think we just underestimate the Donna. I've been there for a few years already. And every time I show up, I still think, holy cow, this thing is good. It is so good. So uh, the expo is held at Jacksonville Jaguar stadium. The expo is on the practice field where the Jaguars practice and it's uh, artificial turf, and it's giant, and it's beautiful. And they, she packs the house with vendors, which is very hard to do. Go talk to any race organization, and they will tell you that filling up their expo hall with vendors is one of the greatest challenges they have. But not Amanda. She packs it full, and it's it's the typical folks you would see. Sparkly Soul is there with the headbands and all sorts of other sparkly things. And, and we've got the folks with sunglasses and there's physical therapy and stuff. But then they have all of these uh, pharmaceutical companies there represented as well because they just want to be a part of this cancer fighting organization. So it's very impressive. And, and they have a, a section in the back with inflatables for kids to bounce around in. Anyways, uh, that's not where I'm going with this, but it's incredible. That that part is impressive on its own. But then the 5K and the Donna Dash, which is one mile, and the Ultra on Saturday, they start and finish on the field where the Jacksonville Jaguars play, on the actual football field. And that itself is fantastic. I mean, it's a beautiful stadium. It's turquoise. It's very, very pretty, but their jumbotron is not a jumbotron. It's a, that's such a understatement to call this screen, a jumbotron. It runs the entire width of the stadium on both end zones. Uh, up until recently, it was the largest jumbotron in the entire NFL. Now I think someone has them beat by one foot, but this thing is a monster. And, <laughs> you know, it's funny for me because as I start the races for the first hour, for the most part, that jumbotron has my big, stupid face on it. It's very bizarre to see your face that big. What is it? Maybe an 18 foot high Fitz face, which is probably enough, right? <laughs> probably more than anyone needs. Sometimes the camera will switch to Donna or Jeff Galloway, who is one of our founders or Eder Perez, one of our oncologists. But Anyways, for the most of the morning before I all go, that that cameraman is assigned to me. Eric was my cameraman. And so that's kind of funny to have this weird jumbotron face experience. But it also is a nice opportunity to connect with other people. And uh, <laughs> once I all go, now the camera starts turning towards all of our athletes. And it's just it's really fun for people to run into the stadium through the breezeways where the football players run out of their tunnel. And uh, yeah, to see people looking at the screens and seeing their own big faces, their own bodies and in such a ginormous, exciting state is really fantastic. But the sound is great and the people come happy. There's so much pink, obviously pink, 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 pink. But we had I mean, we had hundreds of survivors over the weekend, which is people who have had breast cancer or have breast cancer and plenty of people in the middle of treatment running these races. But 
one of the particularly meaningful moments was when a father crossed the finish line with his two very small, maybe five-year-old children and their mother had just passed away. And so that makes you, ah, that's a good reminder of why we do this, right? We're sick of losing mothers, sick of losing wives and sisters and daughters. And I think that's why breast cancer is one of the most well-funded, well-researched types of cancers. People just got sick of losing their their favorite women. Thank goodness for me, because I'm, I'm grateful there was a cure when breast cancer came knocking on my personal door, but uh, very, very tragic to see two children without a mom, right? Right. So, you know, it's a wonderful, happy weekend and there's, there's so much joy. There's certainly tears shed for loss. You know, people who have showed up, Shauna Leninger, who passed away in December, she had a big crew out. There was Sutha or Suthi, who had people that have been coming out for 10 years in her honor. People don't forget. They say, okay, we're running in honor of Suthi and we're going to keep doing it. And so there was a hundred people. It was a, it was an Indian family. And of course they were, had friends that were with them that were not Indian, but uh, they all wore these orange shirts and they they're carrying on her legacy, which is very, very special. And then of course there's a the regular Joes and Janes. And then we have our, our, our breast cancer patients and survivors, which is so much fun for me to welcome each of them by name. If you know someone or love someone who has a history with this disease, you should send them our way. That should be a place they take a pilgrimage to every year. It's a special opportunity. And, a, you know, we say it's the club nobody wants to be a part of. Nobody wants to be a part of the breast cancer club. But once you're a part of it and you can't do anything about it, it's kind of nice to engage with all of these other men and women who have had it too. It's just, I don't know, it's the club we don't want to be a part of, but we are. And, and the members seem to be really sweet and fun to have around. So wherever you come from in the world, you should, you should head over to Jacksonville in February. Now on Sunday is our marathon and our half marathon. And then we have people who are finishing up their 110 mile ultra from Saturday run on Sunday, but we had a beautiful morning. The skies were actually pink and purple. And I yelled, go the crowd wild, just rowdy and fun and celebratory. I love a rowdy start line. In fact, that's my goal. When I start a race, I want it to feel like a rock concert. And the Donna definitely feels like a rock concert. People are losing their marbles as they're running through the start line. And it's just so fun for me. So fun. So the weatherman told us it would rain that day. And boy, did he not disappoint. At about 1130 in the morning, it started raining and it did not stop. It did not stop for the rest of the day. And it didn't just rain. It monsooned. It was full blown downpour. Now, the main concern there is for our runners out finishing up the last half of their marathon in a monsoon. <sighs> but then there's also a few other people that might get wet. I don't have anywhere to hide on race day, at least not at the Donna. On some races, I might stay under a tent, but not at the Donna. On the Donna, I stayed down on foot. And my goal is to catch every single woman or man wearing a survivor bib and celebrate them, get their name, find out how many years out from breast cancer they are and introduce them to the crowd and our crowds go wild. So there was no hiding for me. And so for four hours, I was out there and just drenched. I would say about an hour into the rain, every ounce of me was soaking wet as though I'd been dumped in the ocean nearby. And so it was fun splashing in the rain is always a great opportunity. It was cold. It was 50 something degrees. And I mean, we were, we were jumping in the puddles and it was a really good time. But one of my friends, Jay Sutherland from Marathon Photos, he kept telling me, please, please get dry. Please get an umbrella. You're going to get sick. And I was saying, no, I'm fine. You don't get sick from being wet. Well, that's true. You don't get sick from being wet, but I definitely got sick because I hugged and kissed probably 500 plus people over the weekend, which some may deem unwise. I deem it fortunate. It's such a fun thing to do. I love people and, and it's wonderful when they love you back. So I stood out in the soggy rain like a lunatic. My mother obviously would be very disappointed. That's one of those things where I would think my mom would get mad at me. When I left the Donna, I had a little cough and I thought, okay, well, I'm coughing because I work so hard vocally. And sometimes that happens. My, my throat and stuff is just irritated and I cough a little bit. 
And a couple of days later, it went from cough to fever and chills and shakes. And it just wasn't, it wasn't a good time. I went downhill pretty darn quickly, ended up in urgent care. And that doctor, he tested me for flu. It wasn't the flu. He tested me for strep. It wasn't that. It wasn't COVID. And then he said, well, I think you have pneumonia. And he started an IV and nobody likes an IV. Um, But yeah, it wasn't pneumonia either. It was just some sort of flu-like virus that could not be treated. And honestly, when I'm sick, I don't care what you call it. As long as it's got a solution, I'm game. In fact, sometimes I I hope for strep. I think strep's great. You get strep and then 24 hours later, you feel good, you're strep free. I, I don't care if it's COVID, there's a solution for COVID. They give you COVID medicine. Great, call, call it, <laughs> give me COVID, give me flu, whatever it is, just fix it. But they could not fix it. So I'm going to backtrack a little bit before I go on with the sickness nonsense. Some of the things that were so impressive about the Donna Marathon and Half Marathon was how many of our speedsters, the, of the fastest women who were finishing the full and the half, were in the middle of breast cancer treatment. Now, I would say, how many years out of chemo are you or, or treatment are you? They'd say, well, I had chemo on Tuesday or I have chemo again tomorrow. Just mind-blowing. And if if you have read my book, My Noisy Cancer Comeback, you know that chemo kicked my arse. It kicked it so hard. And while I did my best to stay active during treatment, and I, I definitely did work on staying fit, I did not have the capacity to do anything that looked anything close to a half marathon. So some of these women just, whoa, I, I just can't fathom how they take the poison and then they're able to perform form like that. There's, there's really some magical stuff going on. And I I didn't have that. I really suffered greatly. I did two 5Ks during my breast cancer treatment, uh, official 5Ks, right? And yeah, I, I definitely thought I might need to take a seat during both of them. It was a real struggle for me to get through. And not these girls. These girls were just soldiers. They're like, they're the Navy SEALs of cancer patients. It's just incredible. So that was pretty magical. So having said that, I don't want to complain too much about having this uh, nameless flu-like virus because the nameless flu-like virus was so much better than being chemo sick for a year and a half as I was dancing in the rain, running in the rain, so much easier than having cancer. Everything, everything, Thing you think almost anything in the world is just so much easier than having cancer. So, you know, while we were out there splashing and playing and, and cold and shivering and all of those things, you just got to look around you and know your room and know that there is no pity for people that get to pl- splash in the rain when some folks are sick in the hospital with cancer or sick at home with cancer. But yeah, really inspiring, really impressive, really humbling. And uh, I enjoy every bit of it. It's just magical to be around these people and see what they're doing and know that every step taken during race weekend is actually going for the greater good. People spend those registration dollars and the dollars go straight to helping patients not only uh, get treatment, but pay for their living expenses. Because sometimes when you're sick from chemo, you can't go to work, right? And if you can't go to work, how do you pay for your electricity or your food or your mortgages? And so that's what some of the things the Donna Foundation does is it keeps families afloat during treatment so they can, so they don't have any barriers to getting their treatment and staying in treatment. Because you know what? If a mother can't feed her children, she will sacrifice. She will, she will not show up for chemo she will instead go to work so her kids have food. So uh, the Donna Foundation is a really necessary organization. They do legit good work. And I'm so proud to be a part of that organization. It's just, it's a, it's a really great cause. We have two other race weekends throughout the year. And I think you should consider taking part. I believe they also offer virtuals for most of the race weekends. And that's an opportunity for you to, I hate to use the word donate because you're not, you're investing in a good cause and you're getting to, reap some of the reward by going for a run in your community and uh, taking home one of their beautiful medals. So the Donna Foundation, fantastic. So so here's the deal. I come home and it takes maybe, I don't know, 36 hours for the real sick to kick in. And then I'm wiped out. I'm just, I'm lying there in bed thinking, oh no, I should have published a podcast. (laughs) My people are going to be so sad. Oh no. And then I thought, oh, my people are going to listen to old episodes. So I shouldn't feel too bad about that. But 
it took maybe uh, about a week to get over it completely. And in fact, I think, I think I'm a week out right now, which is great. I'm, I'm depleted still a little bit. Now I had dance rehearsal today and this was another, just one of those humdinger. So a dance rehearsal for my Dancing with the Stars competition is going really well overall. However, we've only known about 90% of the routine for a month and I'm waiting to learn the last 10% and my choreographer just hasn't been teaching it to us, which is somewhat frustrating. What he's been getting caught up on are the details. So instead of teaching Tucker and I the rest of our routine, he'll focus on fixing our footwork or um, probably my footwork or my hip movement or whatever, nickel and diming us, which is fine. It needs to be done. But anyways, today we had rehearsal. And when I showed up, they said, how are you doing? And I said, I'm good, but I'm just getting over being sick. That fell on deaf ears. Nobody heard. Nobody cared. Okay, fine. Uh, we start doing my dance routine. We go through it once and I get done and I'm breathless. I, I'm winded. And I said to Tucker, I said, oh, I'm winded. He goes, oh yeah, it's really vigorous. And in my mind, I was thinking, yeah, I'm not, I'm in good shape. I'm not going to be winded by doing one round of this dance routine. I'm just getting over being sick. And so my choreographer says, well, you know, it's a very vigorous routine and blah, 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 blah. And I said, yeah, I can handle it. I'm just getting over being sick. And it's like, no, no, no. It's just very cardio. And part of me wants to, wants to roll my eyes and say, mm, are you le lecturing Fitz Kohler on cardio? Like I'm the cardio queen. I've got this, trust me, but I don't, I just, I, I take the critique or whatever it is. And I say, okay, keep moving forward. But throughout the, our, our rehearsal, he's, totally dogging me. You're not doing this. You're not doing that. And, and to be honest, I just was less than today because I'm not feeling 100%. So I go through about 50 minutes of this rehearsal where I'm being barked at, barked at, barked at. And the choreographer, choreographer keeps saying like, sorry if I'm being mean. I'm saying, you're not being mean. Just, just keep going. Just tell me what I need to know and I'll fix it. And so at the very end of my rehearsal, we're dancing, the choreographer and I, and he grabs my arm and then he looks and he sees a bruise and he says, did I just bruise your arm? I'm sorry. And I said, no, that's from the IV. And then the two of them looked at each other. It was, it was so funny. And they go, oh, you were really sick. <laughs> I thought, ah, yes, that's what I've been trying to tell you for 50 minutes. I was really sick. I had an IV because I was so sick. So uh, yeah, I got, I got dogged on for a long time today. And I think perhaps if he would have heard me at the start, he might not have been so upset with me, but whatever, whatever. All's well that ends well. I have rehearsal tomorrow and rehearsal Friday. And hopefully by the time Friday rehearsal is over, I will feel great. And I will be moving my hips and arms in a far more delightful manner as you can imagine, there's a lot that goes into being a great dancer. And we think about where to put our feet, but also where the hell do we put our arms? That's a totally valid question. And I don't really have an answer to that. So March 30th, I'm going to be standing out on a stage in a dance floor surrounded by a thousand people in a live audience. And I'm hoping that by that point, I know what to do with my arms, because as of right now, my arms do not have any specific plans. And, uh, yeah, not so excited about that. Okay, I have a thing called the song of the week. You know this, but now you're providing the song of the week. That's right. If you go to fitness.com, you can become a part of this show. And of course, I want to tell your stories because my stories, my story about Linda, Linda smush and pooping in my carpet might not be all you want to hear about. So there's now a section on fitness.com. It says, be a part of our show. And there are several prompts for you to respond to if you have a great story that matches these prompts. Some of the prompts include my epic comeback, my race poop catastrophe, and many others like that. So go ahead and look at the prompts. There's six of them up right now. And then also you can submit song of the week. I love music and I love to share the music I love, but I also love getting great recommendations for a new song. Even just one new song per week can make our playlists, our workouts so much more fun. So this week's submission is from the one and only Jackie Hartley from Atlanta, Georgia. Jackie is a very sweet girl and she's a fantastic runner. And I've seen Jackie all over the country. She's an absolute delight. And 
her song that she's submitting is called It's Not Over Till It's Over. And it's from the band Starship. That's right. She's going all the way back to the 80s. And so I asked her, I said, why do you love it? And when do you listen to it? And she said, well, it's a classic 80s song, but very motivational. It's learning the hard way. There's no giving up until you have a plan. It's not over till it's over. It's not over till we get it right. And she says the song pushes her forward and makes her want to run faster. And it's catchy and motivational. And I agree. So it's very fun and it sounds very 80s. And I want you to know when you're listening to this song on Spotify or Apple Music or wherever the heck you listen to your music, that the band is a hair band. That's right. Not a rocker hair band like Poison, just one of those 80s curly mullet hair bands. And it's not super sexy, not super sexy, but very cool. I don't know. I think you just need to go and look at the album co cover. That's that's what you got to do. Starship, it's not over till it's over. And perhaps it will inspire you to grow out a curly mullet. Why not? The boys are doing it, especially the country boys. Right now, all the country boys in Gainesville, Florida are wearing <laughs> curly mullets. And they're even getting perms. That's right. I spoke to a hairstylist recently who told me she hasn't done a perm on a woman in 20 years, but lately she's been doing perms for all the high school kids. So high school boys, that is high school boys. So this is very important stuff. I feel like we have covered so many useless tidbits for you tonight. That's right. Thank you very much for listening to the fitness show. Talk to your robotic vacuums, let them know that if they smell something to stay away. In fact, if you can program it, that would be nice. Also, next up, for me, the last weekend of February is the Publix Gasparilla Distance Classic. It is coming. If you are somewhere cold and you are sick of being cold, book your flights right now. Fly down to Tampa, Florida for the world's rowdiest pirate running party. We have a 5K, an 8K, a 15K, and a half marathon. Most folks come dressed as pirates. I have pretty jamming pirate costumes myself, and it is such a beautiful weekend and there are so many people. And, and one of the things that is really, really cool is we have added walking divisions to our races. So of course you can always walk any race, any race on earth. You can show up to the Boston Marathon and walk the whole way. There's nobody who's going to hit you with a whip and say, yeah, run boy, run. You, you can't walk. You can walk anywhere. But Gasparilla is saying, all right, we're specifically setting starts just for walkers. So if you feel nervous and you don't believe us that you can walk, come on out. When I yell go for the, I don't know, seventh time for the 5k, we have thousands of people that will exclusively be walking the whole way. And we've added a walking division to our 8k on Sunday too. It's just, I think it's very smart. I think this inclusiveness sometimes gets a little weird. I think this is inclusive in the right way. This is just opening the door a little wider and saying, please come get some exercise have some fun, earn a medal, be part of our, our exercise community. It's all good stuff. So yeah, join me at the Publix Guest Rilla Distance Classic. Run real fast, walk real slow. I don't care. Just show up with a Jolly Roger on your chest and a patch. No, don't wear a patch because then you might trip and fall. But <laughs> we, we are going to have a great time in Tampa. And if you're coming, please stop by and say hello. I will also be doing book signings with Meb Kafleski. So on Friday, we have two book signings at the expo. And then on Saturday, Meb and I have one book signing. And Meb is so sweet. If you don't know Meb, he's he is one of the finest American marathon runners of all time. And he is so sweet. He's won Boston Marathon, New York City Marathon. He's won, I think, silver in the Olympics. He's just, he's a doll. He's very sweet. So I'm also kind of sweet too. So come meet Meb, come meet me. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll take a selfie and have a hug and it'll be great. Uh, if you haven't done so yet, follow Fitness on social media. I'm at Instagram and YouTube and Facebook and fitness.com is always updating. So if you're looking for new fit tips or workout videos or recipes, we're constantly adding them to my website. I would love to see you there. And uh, that's it, y'all. Get to work. Hi, this is Rudy Novotny, the voice of America's marathons. We all love how much running has benefited every aspect of our lives, so much so that most of us only wish we'd started sooner. Wouldn't it be wonderful to gift the opportunity to children of today? Well, you can. The Morning Mile is a before-school walking and running program that gives children the chance to start each day in an active way while enjoying fun, music, and friends. That's every child, 
every day. It's also supported by a wonderful system of rewards, which keeps students highly motivated and frequently congratulated. Created by our favorite fitness expert, Fitz Kohler, morning milers across the country have run over 2 million miles and are having greater success with academics, behavior, and sports because of it. The morning mile is free to the child, free to the school, and is inexpensively funded by businesses or generous individuals. Help more kids get moving in the morning by visiting morningmile.com. Champion the program at your favorite school or find out more about sponsorship opportunities. That's morningmile.com. Long may you run.